Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Tuesday, October 4th, and here's some of what we're talking about tonight. Rescue crews in Florida are looking for survivors door to door. President Biden is about to tour the hardest hit areas. We'll have updates from Southwest Florida. Then, there would have been nothing that would keep me from getting home to my husband and baby. Enduring Ian was hard enough while pregnant with twins, but she spent the aftermath helping storm victims in the hospital for four days in a row. You'll meet her next. People across Japan took shelter after North Korea fired a missile overhead. How should we read this latest threat, and how should the U.S. respond? A former member of the National Security Council joins us ahead. Plus, we'll dig into a Supreme Court case about the Voting Rights Act. It could dramatically change the laws on racial gerrymandering. And a new rule could give flight attendants some much-needed relief on the job. We'll get reaction from their union president. The rescue mission from Hurricane Ian is still underway. Crews in Florida have rescued more than 2,300 people. But eventually, those efforts will shift from rescuing people to recovering bodies. The death toll is at least 108 people, mostly in Florida. Ian killed at least four people in North Carolina. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says that less than 4% of Floridians are still without power. He also announced a plan to help small businesses get back to work. Today, the Florida Small Business Emergency Bridge Loan Program, we've made $50 million available, um, and we've uh, put aside $10 million of that for agriculture uh, businesses, small businesses, that have been impacted by Hurricane Ian. So what this program does in terms of the loans, it gives short-term zero-interest loans to small businesses that experience economic injury or physical damage due to Hurricane Ian. So if, you're, if your business got damaged, you can't be in, in business until it gets fixed, you can get a bridge loan to get you through there. NBC Shaquille Brewster joins us from Fort Myers Beach with more. Shaq, how is the work proceeding there tonight? There's still a lot of work to do, but you are seeing those signs of progress, Joshua. Whether we're talking about things like communications and our ability to broadcast to you from other areas of Fort Myers, or if you're talking about the cleanup, official debris removal has begun in the Fort Myers area and Fort Myers area and across the entire region. You you are starting to see those forms of improvement, those signs of improvement. You mentioned the power situation is also improving, but you're also having a situation where many people are coming back into this area, coming back to their homes and communities and seeing all that was lost. We were in a community that was about three miles from where I'm standing now or from Fort Myers Beach, about two miles from the largest body of water, the river next to them, and they were completely flooded. That entire neighborhood, it looks as if every house had their contents, the entire contents outside on the curb there, and people were going through, picking up the last pieces of what they can do and clearing out their homes and figuring out what those next next steps were. I want you to actually listen to someone I met there. Uh, Sue was her name. She was there uh, with her husband. She said she almost stayed in her home. Her home eventually had a four and a half foot uh, watermark line. She almost stayed and rode out the storm in her home, but she got a call from a friend that told her to leave immediately. Listen to what she came back to. Well, there's nothing you can do about it. You got to do what you got to do, you know? How emotional does it get? Bad. This is everything we've all worked our whole life for. Absolutely. And it's gone. In a flash. Her neighbor right across the street from her, it was a family that actually stayed in and rode out the storm from their house. This family that actually came from the Dominican Republic uh, three years ago, a family of four, uh, rode out the storm. At one point, they went up to the attic of the house because they saw the water rising. Again, this was an area not along the shore, not a beachside community, but really three miles from the beach, two miles from the river. You just get a clearer sense each day how wide of an impact, how large the storm is and what kind of effect this had on so many people.
Yeah, that's exactly why they try to tell people to evacuate, because once the Gulf of Mexico rises, it's all the Caloosahatchee River doesn't mean a thing. It's all one rising body of water. But before I got to let you go, Shaq, what about the recovery effort? There's a huge amount of infrastructure, rescue crews and so on. How is that going? Well, this is still a search and rescue mission officially by FEMA, but when you talk to officials, including the Fort Myers mayor who was on MSNBC earlier today, he's acknowledging the reality that we are about a week since this storm made landfall. So this is more like a search and recovery mission. Of course, we want people to be recovered alive, but it's turning more into a search and recovery mission where you're continuing to see that death toll increase. So Fort Myers Beach, that area is still completely closed off to civilians. The families who I, I kind of showed you a little bit earlier who they got to see the damage, well, if you're in Fort Myers Beach, you still can't go and survey the area and see what damage is there and what can be salvaged at that point. Um, but you still have the situation where FEMA's going through the city. We were in that community where FEMA arrived for the very first time for those folks there, and we saw that assessment take place. They go house to house. They take pictures if there's any structural damage. They were really asking to see if anyone rode out the storm in that area so they can get a sense of how high that water rose. So that process is still underway. It's going to be a long recovery, but you hear folks, and I, I talked to folks really all across the city today, they, most of them are just grateful that they have their lives. They're grateful that most of their power is being restored, um, but they know that they have a lot of work to do and a, lot, a long road ahead to recovery. I hear that. Thank you, Shaq. That's NBC Shaquille Brewster starting us off tonight from Fort Myers Beach. Well, today, Governor DeSantis shared a statistic about the size of Florida's rescue effort. He claimed that right now, Florida has more urban search and rescue capacity than any state has had since the 9-11 terror attacks. Now, we've not verified that claim, but there's no denying how vast and diverse these crews are, from FEMA to state and county and local agencies, and even civilians who showed up to help out where they can. Let's continue now with Jordy Bloodsworth. He's with the Louisiana Cajun Navy, a citizen-led organization devoted to disaster relief. Mr. Bloodsworth, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you very much for having me. What is the Louisiana Cajun Navy? Give us the basics on who you are and what you do. Uh, it's a civilian volunteer grassroots group that uh, we just come together and try to help in any kind of natural disaster. And unfortunately, for the past few years, it's been hurricane after hurricane. But um, we just have a network of volunteers and supporters, and we go out and try to make a difference. Talk about what you've been doing and seeing in Florida. I, I'm guessing that y'all are mostly focused on southwest Florida, where Ian came ashore, right? Yes, sir. We've been uh, stationed in Fort Myers, and we've been going to Sanibel Island and Pine Island by boat. Uh, we've had several different teams, and I'm working with another uh, Cajun Navy group as well, you know. Um, and we've had boat teams going out uh, to bring supplies, uh, bring uh, homeowners back to houses, get people off of the island. Uh, it's been really busy, but in the last day or so, they've kind of been limiting that traffic on uh, just trying to get a handle on it. Um, and areas as well like Inglewood that were a little bit farther inland and um, Arcadia also kind of not getting forgotten about, but, you know, they're not as popular or known areas. So uh, we've been sending people by truck and boat there as well to do some wellness checks and some uh, rescue calls. What have you been encountering in terms of just boating around southwest Florida? I'm from Florida, so I'm used to kind of the way that the state can go from marsh and Everglades to housing developments like that. And when the Gulf rose, all those rivers, the Peace River, the Caloosahatchee, all of them, they just kind of became the Gulf in some ways. Have you been noticing kind of wildlife in urban areas or like what has it been like in terms of just the risks of boating around that area? Um, surprisingly, not a lot of wildlife. Um, I'm a full-time boat captain, so I'm, I kind of pay attention to this thing a lot. Uh, the current is very 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 strong uh and the amount of boat traffic is just making it worse but like you said going from small community areas through canals into open water uh, and things of that nature there's tons of debris out in the water in the bays so i mean you're navigating around boat docks sunken boats there's porta potties uh palm trees anything you can think of and you know it might be eight foot in one area and if you're a little bit off it could be you know six inches deep um 
but we've been running airboats, thankfully, so we don't have to necessarily worry about the depth of the water. But it's still pretty dangerous with the amount of people uh, going out there and some of the boats that are going. You know, everybody's just taking anything they can get their hands on to go out there. And it could be a little tricky for some of these smaller vessels that are trying to go back and forth. Talk about how y'all interface with some of the officials and urban search and rescue groups that are there. When you show up, do you let them know, hey, y'all, we're here, we're going to go that way. If we find anyone, we'll let you know. Like, how does that coordination work? Yeah, usually uh, when we're coming into an area, we try to contact, you know, the local game and fish or wildlife fisheries, whatever you may call it, uh, sheriff's department, things like that, um, and other groups or locals that anyone we can get in touch with so that there isn't more of a problem made, that no one's getting in the way necessarily, or um, you're not going to an area that's might have already been cleared. So like this, where we're launching, there's actually boat launches we can use. You know, we're not doing it on the side of the road for the most part. So we can uh, we can talk with the Coast Guard, you know, the Sheriff's Department, the Wildlife and Fisheries agents, um, and there's been a huge presence of them uh, that we've had pretty good communication with that's enabled us to know where we need to go, where we don't need to go, and, you know, kind of stay out of their way and cooperate without, you know, causing any more issues. I know I got to let you go in a second, but I can only imagine what y'all have encountered when you run up on somebody who needs to be rescued and just the emotions that they're dealing with. I know what it's like to be, you know, stuck on the side of the road waiting for somebody to pick me up for an hour, but I can't even imagine what it's like when your home is destroyed and you're waiting for a human being to come pick you up and take you to safety. What have you seen or heard from people once once you show up? Um, it's It gives me goosebumps just, you know, hearing it, thinking about it. These people literally just lost everything, um, you know, in a matter of hours overnight, um, just kind of out of nowhere. And my family lost everything in Katrina, so I think that's why um, it kind of has a little piece of my heart. But, um, like, even you pick these people up, you hand them a bottle of water, offer them a ride, offer to help them carry some things out of the house and get it on the boat so they can salvage it. Um, you know, they're just so grateful uh, for everything. We get them back on land, and we have a donation center set up in Fort Myers. Um, one of my guys called me today, and uh, he had just gotten there, and I was asking him how it was going. And uh, he said, I gave a lady a bag of ice today, and she just started crying. Um, so I think that kind of puts things into perspective for a lot of people, just the smallest thing, and that's why we do it, just to go help and try to make a difference. You know, if we can help one person, it's a success. Yeah, in a disaster, it's kind of amazing how gratitude feels a little different with kind of the perspective of going through something like this. And we're grateful that you made time to talk to us tonight. Jordy Bloodsworth from the Louisiana Cajun Navy. Thanks for making time for us and stay safe. Thank you. Some Floridians stayed behind during Ian to work through the hurricane. We met an ICU nurse in Fort Myers who treated patients for days, all the while disconnected from her own family. But that family is about to grow any day now. NBC's Dasha Burns has her story. Hey, Dasha. Joshua, you know, when we cover events like this, it's so important to remember that every disaster story is a human story. Every damaged building you see has a family, has a business owner, has a life and a livelihood tied to it. And when you hear those numbers about the scope and the scale of the search and rescue efforts here, of the recovery efforts here, there are so many stories, so many unsung heroes, so many challenges and sacrifices embedded in those statistics. And I want to introduce you to one of the most powerful stories I've heard since covering Hurricane Ian. Pediatric ICU nurse Eileen Ular spent Hurricane Ian doing what nurses do, taking care of her patients at Golisano Children's Hospital. We maintained the same level of patient care that we always do, which is exceptional. Um, loved and supported the families any way that we possibly could. If there was a need, we tried to fulfill it. Um, same thing for each other. But it's this photo of her baby girl that helped her make it through. The last time I saw her or spoke with her was Wednesday morning. We were trying to FaceTime, but of course there was no service at that point. So it was just a still frame of her smiling. And that was... How much did you look at that still frame? I still look at it. And her daughter, Bryn, is about to be a big sister. Hi. 
Eileen is 32 weeks pregnant with twins. She's also part of the hospital's hurricane emergency team. They reach out to us individually, say hurricane teams, emergency teams have been activated, pack your cars and come to the hospital. And you're team A. I am team A. So you're going in before and you're not coming out till it's done? The entire time. Packed the car, packed everything up, hugged my sweet baby who's only a year and a half, who I have never been away from before. For more than ever. I've never been away from her overnight. Very early on we lost power. Next was sewage and water, which of course was difficult. Um, you can no longer use our water machines, our ice machines, so everything is bottled. The nursing team slept in a storage unit on spare hospital beds. You're pregnant with twins. I am pregnant with twins, 32 weeks. How does that factor into the equation? Um, well, it certainly it makes everything more difficult. Yeah, I'm actually having a, a contraction bit. right now. Take, take your time, take your time. <laughs> it's okay. But while keeping other people's children safe, Eileen couldn't protect her own. How do you deal with that? You compartmentalize. I was meant to be here. I'm meant to be here. I will be a pediatric ICU nurse my entire life. So that doesn't make the decisions any easier. It doesn't make leaving my baby any easier. I lost contact with my husband very early on. Um, so you didn't know what was going on? If they were okay, if our retention pond behind our house flooded and the house was underwater, if they were alive, no. I didn't, not, not for um, over a day. Several of my coworkers were unable to reach family for an extended period of time. So it's hard to then be the helpers that we are, the workers that we are, and not be able to help them. I mean, it was a crisis for everyone. How would you describe those 24 hours? Even at 32 weeks pregnant, if I had been released from emergency team A and allowed to go home, I would have walked home to get to them. I'm sorry. There would have been nothing that would keep me from getting home to my husband and baby. Nothing. But finally, happy tears when they were reunited. So Will pulled up, um, and of course, as I'm crying, which Bryn does not see very often, she was saying, Mommy's sad, Mommy's sad. And I said, no, Mommy is so happy. On top of worrying about her husband and her daughter, Eileen was also worried about her brother and his family, his children, who live on Pine Island, one of those barrier islands that was extremely hard hit. They're okay, they're safe, but their home completely destroyed. Thankfully, Eileen's home is still standing. She's got some damage to her roof, some burst pipes, all of which will have to be cleaned up very quickly to get her home ready for those two babies that are due very, very soon. Joshua. Thank you, Dasha. That's NBC's Dasha Burns with the story. Still to come, new rules for flight attendants. The FAA is changing how much downtime they'll get between shifts. We'll have reaction from the president of the Flight Attendants Union. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. Spare a thought for your flight attendant. Their workday can be as long as 14 hours, and often they don't get much downtime. But now, the Federal Aviation Administration is setting new rules on that. It will require 10 consecutive hours of rest between shifts. The new regulations are designed to help flight attendants do their jobs. This already challenging work got even harder during the pandemic, and some of us passengers are clearly making it worse. Last year, the FAA reported nearly six thousand incidents with unruly passengers. So far this year, it's reported more than 2,000. This morning, the agency's acting administrator, Billy Nolan, spoke about the new regulation. I can tell you firsthand that well-rested crew members are important to safety. And as we've seen too often recently, they are in the front lines, or they are on the front lines, responding to unruly passengers who could threaten the safety of flight and other passengers. Joining us now is Sarah Nelson, Union President of the Association of Flight Attendants. Ms. Nelson, welcome. Good to see you again. Great to be with you, Joshua. So what do you make of this regulation change? How different is this revised rule from what flight attendants were entitled to in terms of uh, downtime? 
this is a huge difference, and this is something our union has been working on for 30 years, uh, way back when Norm Mineta first proposed this in 1994. Uh, we had to work on the science. Uh, we had to show that flight attendants were actually fatigued. And what this means is that in the operation, airlines could schedule flight attendants to nine hours, but they could bring them down to eight hours. That eight hours is from the time we step off the plane until we step back on the plane again the next day. So that means getting through the airport, getting something to eat, calling our families, getting undressed into bed, trying to settle down. Uh, get a little rest, and then do the routine in the morning to get ready, go back and do your briefing, get through the airport, all of that. Uh, all of that was counted as part of the rest. So that meant four to five hours in the bed, changing this from eight hours to 10 hours, irreducible rest, two additional hours, a chance for us to get eight hours, but certainly six or seven is a huge relief to flight attendants who have been working around the clock and working longer days, frankly, since this pandemic. Talk a little bit more about the pandemic. You and I have spoken about the impact that COVID has had on flight attendants and on airlines and just on the business in general. How are flight attendants doing these days in terms of the worst of COVID apparently for now being over and there being so much demand, pent up demand for people to travel? How are flight attendants holding up? I mean, this is really difficult. This has been the most difficult sustained time in the history of aviation for flight attendants. Being on the front lines with minimum uh, crew members, more passengers than ever, no space on our planes. Generally, people who are not used to flying or infrequent travelers, so a lot of questions, even if you don't have that conflict. And then, of course, the conflict that you were just talking about has been uh, extremely risky, extremely dangerous, and has led flight attendants to think when they're putting on that uniform. Is that going to be a sign of leadership and reassurance in the cabin for people that day, or is it going to be a target for a violent attack? And this has been a very difficult time to work through. Billy Nolan, the acting FAA administrator we heard from, talked about the role that flight attendants play in flight, including in emergency situations. Here is more of what he said this morning. Watch. I'm a pilot. And as any pilot can tell you, we cannot fly the plane without the safety expertise and support of flight attendants. They know the location of every piece of equipment needed during an emergency. Fire extinguishers, first aid kits, flotation devices, oxygen masks, and emergency slides. Sarah Nelson, give me an example of something among all of those duties that he referred to that you're concerned about doing wrong, doing improperly, if you're sleep deprived? Like, are there one or two duties in particular that, pardon the pun, keep flight attendants up at night when they can't get enough rest? Sure, absolutely. Uh, not responding quickly enough to a medical emergency and we're the only responders there and our slow action means that someone actually loses their life. Uh, not getting to a fire fast enough that starts with a cell phone or a laptop computer um, or some other malfunction on the plane. We know that little problems become big problems very, very quickly. It can actually threaten the lives of everyone on board. And if we're, if we're really not alert enough to be able to respond and get people off that plane or to be able to recognize a security threat or just someone who is threatening the, the safety of everyone on board because they are acting out, we're not getting to that quickly enough, or we're not able to respond in a way that best utilizes our de-escalation skills to be able to bring those, the temperatures down, people can get hurt. These are very serious issues, and this has been a serious safety loophole that we're closing with this rest regulation. And it's based on science that shows that flight attendant fatigue is real, it is frequent, and the best way to combat it is more rest. Before I let you go, I want to share something that occurred to me on a flight I took uh, a few weeks ago. I came up with a term for some of these people. Fufu. F-U-F-U, -F -U, which stands for feet up F-U. And I define oh. a fufu as a person said in their inappropriate, unhelpful, or boorish ways who defiantly rejects more reasonable behavior. I was sitting, and a dude in first class had his feet right up on the uh. wall of the first class no, cabin. No, no. And I thought, of all places to put your feet up and be disrespectful here to these people, before I have to let you go, I got to ask the question that I keep hearing people ask. What the hell is wrong with some of these people? Why don't passengers <laughs> respect the work that flight attendants do? I really don't get it. I, if you understand it, I'd um, love to know before we go. What is up with some people? My gosh. 
I really appreciate this question, but I do want to remind you that the vast majority of people come to the door of our plane wanting just a safe, uneventful flight, and they are people who want to be yes. helpers. Um, but but we hear more often, and just a few people can make it miserable for all of us. People are super, super stressed out. We are often on the tip of the sphere for political or social issues happening in the country. There has been this... Um, narrative from leadership that there is a major divide in this country and have kept people at odds and in total anxiety. Not to mention the fact that inequality is running rampant and people can't afford to live where they are. They can't afford to get health care for their family and friends. People have to beg for sick leave if they're sick. Um, the conditions in this country are just driving people insane. Sarah Nelson, Union President of the Association of Flight Attendants, thank you for letting me vent about the foo-foo on my flight. I'm not going to think about him anymore, and I appreciate the work that flight attendants do. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see you, too. Take care, Joshua. We will get to some of today's other top stories in just a moment, including new protections for reproductive rights from the Biden administration and an update on Elon Musk's plans to buy Twitter after all. Tonight's headlines begin with new actions by the president to protect abortion access. President Biden and top White House officials announced the measures today. It's been 100 days since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. The administration estimates that about 30 million women of reproductive age now live in states that ban abortion. NBC White House correspondent Mike Memoli has more on the president's plans. Hey, Mike. Well, Joshua, President Biden today convened just the second meeting of his task force on reproductive health. And the purpose, at least according to the White House, was to mark the 100 days that have elapsed since that historic Dobbs decision struck down the constitutional protections for an abortion. And really, though, I think what the White House signaled today and the president himself was the focus is on what's happening in just over 35 days, and that, of course, is the midterm election. The president outlining what he sees as the continued uh, threats to women's health if there is not a national protection, efforts to codify the protections under Roe versus Wade. We also heard from Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, she said that we need a national law to protect abortion rights, and the American people need to make their voices heard. That's as close as you're going to get at an official White House event to a message that clearly aligns with the message Democratic candidates are getting uh, and putting out to voters throughout the country. And we have seen some slippage of an advantage Democrats were seeing in some of these midterm races as uh, the polls are tightening in key states. And there is concern at the White House that this is not necessarily as high profile an issue as it needs to be, particularly as Republicans are finding great traction in issues uh, like crime and immigration. So the White House trying to refocus that message. And as part of the president's event today, he also announced some new actions the president was taking through his executive order. First, the president issuing an executive order to reiterate through Title IX the protections for college students, particularly women, of course, against being discriminated on the basis of pregnancy. The second, which is more substantively, I think, important, uh, is to increase funding through so-called Title X grants. These are grants that are available to those who are either low income or without insurance to gain access to family planning services. Uh, this could be significant, especially the kind of significant increase the president is proposing for Title Title 10 funding in the year ahead. But one of the doctors that the president heard from as part of the discussion today talked about the fact that there are crisis on top of crisis that have resulted from the Dobbs decision, as they're seeing on the front lines here in hospitals, women really suffering potentially uh, life-threatening uh, conditions because of the confusion that was created by the Dobbs decision. Another doctor said that we need to see bold, brave, and immediate action uh, from the administration, suggesting that maybe they have fallen short so far. But ultimately, as the president said, we need more votes in the Senate, and that was part of why the president had this today, to try to raise this as an election issue. Joshua? Thank you, Mike. That's NBC White House correspondent Mike Memoli reporting. Well, it looks like Elon Musk's concerns about Twitter won't stop him from buying the company after all. Today, his lawyer confirmed that his client will do so. The price tag remains the same, $44 billion. Mr. Musk first made that offer back in April. That's just over $54 a share. He pulled the offer, claiming that the social network was overrun by spam accounts. Twitter sued him for trying to kill the buyout. But yesterday, 
Elon Musk's legal team filed a letter with federal regulators, and it also notified Twitter that the deal is on as long as the company drops its lawsuit. Now, it's unclear why exactly Musk revived his buyout plans, nor do we know if Twitter will drop the suit, but a statement from the company says that it intends to close the deal. One of Silicon Valley's biggest critics has a new job in the industry. Meredith Whitaker will be the president of Signal. It's a not-for-profit messaging app that fully encrypts posts. But part of Whitaker's plan appears to be making users pay for the service. She spoke exclusively to NBC Tech correspondent Jake Ward. You know that old adage that if a product is free, then you are the product? Well, nobody knows that better than Meredith Whitaker. She's a former very public critic of big tech, and now she's about to become a tech executive. She hopes that we can all somehow escape the era of surveillance we are all in right now, where big tech companies are tracking our every move by perhaps adopting a product like the one she is about to run, the messaging app Signal. We sat down in an exclusive interview to talk about the age of big tech and how she thinks we can all fight back against it. The new president of Signal is a very unusual tech executive. Best known for critiquing companies, not leading them, Meredith Whitaker now runs what experts call the last truly anonymous messaging platform. It's used by journalists, world leaders, activists, and criminals, anyone who wishes to keep their communications absolutely private. Whitaker first became nationally known in the tech industry as a leader of walkouts at Google over a controversial military program there. One night, I hear from somebody I know that Google is signing a contract with the U.S. Department of Defense to build machine vision, which is a type of, you know, automated AI for drone surveillance and targeting for the U.S. drone program. Every angle of that, it's pretty messy. She organized protests and left Google in 2019 to create an ethics institute at NYU. Whitaker was then recruited by Lena Kahn, the Federal Trade Commission chair, to be an in-house academic in the commission's work to regulate big tech. We can walk down the street, not know we're being profiled by facial recognition cameras. Those images can be sent to different data brokers and they can inform AI models that then inform our chances of employment. We have no idea any of this is happening. Why suddenly take the reins of an organization after all this time analyzing them from both the inside and the outside? This was a project that was funded by grants at the beginning that is a nonprofit. So this is not a tech company, again, that is governed by the surveillance business model, that is governed by the pursuit of profit. The mission of Signal is to provide access to truly private digital communications whenever they want it. How will you pay for this? How will you keep it going? Some percentage of the many millions of people who use Signal will be willing to kick in, say, you know, five dollars a month. Because we don't monetize our data, because we don't collect any of that data to be monetized, we need to support Signal otherwise. Whitaker says it's clear that Signal is the most anonymous major tech platform. WhatsApp is encrypted, she points out, but it's owned by Facebook parent Meta. So you can join the limited data that WhatsApp has with the massive stores of surveillance data that Facebook has and produce some pretty staggering insights. On the other hand, Signal doesn't have any of that data. Law enforcement regularly subpoenas tech companies, including Signal, for things like messages, pictures, phone logs, and has criticized the industry for being opaque. How do you articulate what it is about the surveillance economy that has made everything free, has made all of us the product, and that you can only really escape if you use a service like yours and kick in five bucks if you can? People over the past half decade have grown to recognize that there's a real problem with a handful of companies having such a monumental amount of intimate information about all of us that they routinely share with states. I don't think all tech needs to exist because most tech that exists was built because somebody thought they could make money off it. And you can make a lot of money selling real-time facial recognition to oppressive police departments. You can make a lot of money selling surveillance and monitoring equipment to stalkers, right? Like there are some really bad tech business models. I think arguably many of those should not exist. Now, she has to develop a way to protect and grow the one company she says fits with her mission of fighting off surveillance in our lives. We exist to provide a protected enclave where we can have actually private, experimental, intimate conversations without being caught up in the nexus of corporate state surveillance. That's why I'm there.
Now, it's important to understand here just how difficult it will be to make money doing what Whitaker and Signal propose to do. It is an extraordinarily widely used platform, but it does not generate money in the way that so many other platforms do. It does not sell our data out the back. As a result, they really do have to come to us and ask for donations. That seems to be her plan to try and make money off of this. And it really speaks to just the enormous, complex ecosystem of data being secretly sold about all of us that has driven big tech until now. Back to you. Thank you, Jake. That's NBC Tech correspondent Jake Ward reporting. The country music world is remembering legendary artist Loretta Lynn. She died this morning. Loretta Lynn was the first woman to win the Country Music Association's Entertainer of the Year Award. Her songs tackled sensitive topics as well as her humble beginnings. Yes, she really was the daughter of a Kentucky coal miner. That song also became a best-selling book and an Oscar-winning movie. Her accolades include multiple Grammys and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. She is survived by four children, many grandchildren, and great-grands. Memorial plans are pending. Loretta Lynn lived to be 90. And we've got some breaking news from Major League Baseball. Sorry to those of you who are not fans of the Yankees, but the control room insisted. A home run, rec run record was broken tonight. New York Yankee Aaron Judge hit his 62nd homer of the season, and that breaks the American League's single-season record. Fellow Yankee Roger Maris held that record for the last 61 years. The overall Major League home run record is held by Barry Bonds. He hit 73 homers in 2001. Up next, North Korea's latest threat. It launched another missile, this time over Japan. How are the U.S. and its allies responding? And what's North Korea's endgame? That's just ahead. Stay close. North Korea is testing the resolve of some world leaders after shooting a missile over Japan. This morning, the North conducted its farthest weapons test yet. It sent a ballistic missile over Japan's northeastern coast. That missile was capable of carrying a nuclear weapon. To be clear, we don't think it actually had one. But the shot triggered alerts on cell phones, radios, and public speakers. The missile flew 2,800 miles. It splashed down in the Pacific Ocean, 2,000 miles east of Japan. In response, the U.S. and South Korea fired tactical missiles into the Sea of Japan. North and South Korea are on the other side. President Biden also spoke with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. He reinforced America's commitment to Japan's defense. North Korea has conducted five missile tests in just the last 10 days. Let's discuss it with NBC News Korean Affairs Analyst Victor Cha. He's the Senior Vice President for Asia and Korea Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Dr. Cha, welcome. Good to see you. Thanks, Joshua. Good to be with you. I always struggle with what to make of these missile tests because if you could send a missile over Japan, you could target a missile to Japan. Why is North Korea threatening with these kind of flyovers and splashdown tests? Do we actually think that it's actually going to fire a missile at Japan or at South Korea anytime? So I think one of the reasons they do it, Joshua, is they want to get attention. And so if you fly one over the sovereign territory of one of the largest economies in the world, it's going to get people's attention. Uh, previous to this, most of the missiles they tested fell in between Korea and Japan, in the East Sea or in the Sea of Japan. But they haven't flown one over Japan for five years now. In addition to that, they're testing a capability that goes much further than Japan. They're testing um, eventually what will be an IRBM or an ICBM capability, because what they want to do is to demonstrate that they can reach the United States. I wonder where that goes from there, Dr. Cha. I mean, the possibility of North Korea having a missile that could transit the Pacific Ocean and hit the coast of San Francisco, Seattle, or farther has been something that the West is worried about for a while. 
What do you think North Korea's endgame is? Are they actually going to try to hit the U.S., to hit, you know, friendly Western nations in Eastern Europe? Like, where is this going? Yeah, so I, I mean, their end game is to develop uh, a nuclear, a nuclear weapons capability and a ballistic missile capability to, to threaten the homeland of the United States. Not that they would actually use that weapon to attack a U.S. city, but the ability to hold a U.S. city hostage would then render um, lots of concerns in Japan and Korea about the U.S. willingness to come to the defense of Japan or South Korea, something known as extended nuclear deterrence. If North Korea can create uncertainty about the U.S. commitment by holding U.S. cities hostage, they feel they have much more leverage over countries closer to them in the region, in particular South Korea and Japan. And they may use nuclear co coercion at that point to try to extract economic assistance, the lifting of sanctions, uh, uh, political relations, things that they want. Remember, North Korea doesn't have much to negotiate with. They don't, they don't have an economy. They don't have anything else. But they do have the peaceful status quo, which we care about. And so they may try to leverage that with, with nuclear weapons. The U.S. has requested a U.N. Security Council meeting to deal with this incursion. China and Russia say they are opposing the idea. I wonder what the next move is. I find it, and maybe I'm just viewing this very obliquely, but I find it hard to believe that North Korea would hit South Korea, Japan, with some kind of a missile strike, and the West would not show up. Like, I can't contemplate a situation where that would happen. So diplomacy makes sense, but I have a hard time believing the U.S. would just be like, that was really rough for you. Like, is that actually a possibility, that the U.S. would just fold its arms and do nothing? Well, I certainly don't think that would be a possibility under the current administration, under the Biden administration. But remember, just a couple of years ago, we had a different administration in office that made pretty clear they didn't really care about the, any of the short-range missiles that North Korea was firing on Japan or South Korea, and that they only cared about the long-range missiles. Um, we're talking about Donald Trump, of course. So I think from the perspective of our allies in the region, they trust what the United States says, but they don't know that the government that's in the White House today will be the, the same one uh, with the same intention that's, that's in there in the future. With regard to the UN Security Council, I think you're right. I mean, in the past, we could go to the UN Security Council and get many resolutions on North Korea, but the current state of US-China and US-Russia relations really makes that impossible. NBC News Korean Affairs Analyst, Dr. Victor Cha, good to see you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ukrainian forces are continuing their advance on Russian-held areas. Today, President Zelensky bragged about what he called new liberated settlements. Ukraine's military is gaining momentum in the south and the east. Meanwhile, the Biden administration is doubling down on its support. Today, it announced a massive new package of military aid. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin has the details on that. Hey, Aaron. Hey there. Tonight, President Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky all had a phone conversation tonight. I have a copy of the White House's readout of the call. Let me read you a section of their discussion. It says, quote, President Biden pledged to continue supporting Ukraine as it defends itself from Russian aggression for as long as it takes, including the provision today of a new $625 million security assistance package that includes additional weapons and equipment, including HIMARS, artillery systems and ammunition and armored vehicles. This, as Ukrainian forces have been making sweeping gains, not only in the eastern Donbass, but also to the south. It also comes as President Zelensky striking out at billionaire Elon Musk after Musk took to Twitter to provide his own unsolicited peace plan, asking his 100 million followers to vote on it. President Zelensky tweeting out to his own followers, his own poll, asking them what Elon Musk they like the, the one that likes Russia or the one that likes Ukraine. Back to you. Thank you, Aaron. That's NBC's Aaron McLaughlin reporting from Ukraine. Voting rights are back on the docket at the Supreme Court with another case from Alabama. We'll break down the case and hear from both parties before we go.
The future of the Voting Rights Act is the focus of a case before the Supreme Court. Today, justices heard oral arguments on Merrill versus Milligan. It focuses on Alabama's new congressional maps. Civil rights activists say losing the case would diminish the voting power of people of color. NBC Washington correspondent Yamiche Alcindor has the story. It was a big day at the Supreme Court. Justices heard oral arguments for a landmark case focused on race, voting rights, and gerrymandering. I sat down with the plaintiffs and the defendant to talk about the significance of Merrill v. Milligan. Take a listen. For generations, Alabama has been home to seminal civil rights battles. It was here that Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King led the fight against Jim Crow laws. Now activists say there is a new front line for equality, redistricting. We would ask that federal courts would intervene and, and, and uh, require them to look at the population, to look at the voting history of our state, and to produce maps that actually give black Alabamians a chance to, rep to elect uh, candidates of their choice in a way that actually rep represents their population in the state. Evan Milligan is talking about the marquee U.S. Supreme Court case bearing his name, Merrill v. Milligan. The case, which is before the court this week, centers on voting rights and gerrymandering. Currently, only one of the state's seven congressional districts is majority black. That's 14 percent. Alabama's population is 27 percent black. Milligan and other plaintiffs say the newly drawn congressional map dilutes the voting power of black residents. They are demanding the state create a second majority black district by breaking it up. We had to fight for freedom. We had to fight for the right to vote. And now we're fighting for redistricting. Democracy is under attack and the country as we know it, if we continue on the road that we're on right now, we will not be able to recognize or even spell democracy in this country. Milligan, whose ancestors were enslaved six generations ago, comes from a family of civil rights activists. He says losing the case would be devastating for generations. What's at stake is um, our ability to have integrity in front of our children. Yeah. Losing in my mind would mean that, that uh, we're, we're at a situation where, where we're definitely going backwards in terms of voting rights in this country. Yes. Defendant, Alabama Secretary of State John Merrill, didn't draw the new congressional maps, but he says he is confident the state will be able to successfully defend them. So what, what's your response to um, civil rights activists and voters who say that the current congressional lines are diluting African-American voting power in this state? Well, my response is they have the lines that were presented to them by the members of the Alabama legislature. If they're not pleased with that, then they need to change the constituency of the Alabama legislature or the congressional delegation. We have 67 counties and we have 463 municipalities and people in our state have the opportunity to choose where they live. They can locate or relocate wherever they, they want to. That's absurd. That's offensive. The notion that you have to move in order to get fairness, you have to move to be treated um, equally uh, is really something that's hard to believe that uh, a, a responsible state official um, could say. Former Attorney General Eric Holder has focused much of his attention on fighting gerrymandering. Through a new group, the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, he's helped file lawsuits throughout the country over the past few years, including this case in Alabama. What does Alabama and that case represent overall for the United States? What is it a microcosm of? It's a microcosm of um, a, a larger problem. Um, you know, gerrymandering negatively impacts the nation as a whole, but disproportionately negatively impacts people of color. This is fundamentally a question of fairness. Now both sides will make their oral arguments before the Supreme Court. Today's oral arguments had some tense moments, including when the court's three liberal justices hammered Alabama on their argument. Though afterwards, both sides told me they believe they did a good job in arguing their stances. Now the nation's highest court will determine whether federal law requires that states with large populations of people of color and racially polarized voting will have to take race into account in redistricting or whether they will have free reign. That was NBC Washington correspondent Yamish Alcindor reporting. Hey, thank you for making time for us tonight. We'd love to hear from you on this case, 
on the home run race or on any of the topics that we discussed tonight. We're at NBC Now Tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, or Instagram. You can leave us a brief but brilliant voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622. Or email us, now tonight at NBCNews.com. So until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.